I can't remember exactly what I was thinking when six years ago I applied for this funded PhD in trans sexualities. I guess I thought, well, they'll never give it to me anyway. I guess I thought, if they do, maybe I can do this differently. I guess I had in mind the hot, fresh memory of our writhing bodies in that club in Vauxhall. The feminist fisting workshop, the porn film festival when so many of us descended on the sex-segregated spa they gave up trying to separate us. The trans pride after party turned four or more G. I guess I thought, I think I have something to say about trans sex. I guess what I felt was a hopeful shift, the tipping, tipping, tipping. The transformative potential of queer and trans fucking, which is to say queer and trans art, which is to say queer and trans love. What I do remember is this. I remember I was about to retake my GCSE exams because school, which gave me nothing but a pathological fear of learning and an immediate shame response that accompanies me to this day in all public speaking, failed me and I left with only a handful. I remember the Pulse nightclub shooting gathering at the Pleasure Gardens to hold vigil. I remember buses to Bedford packed with queers and feminists, the immigrant-led movement for justice surrounding Yarl's Wood Women's Detention Centre chanting, shut it down, shut it down. I remember King's Cross St Pancras Eurostar Terminal, people's hands glued to turnstiles chanting, your borders kill, your borders kill, and rivers of crimson on the marble station floor. I remember the ads on the tube after Sisters Uncut closed the bridges of London, protesting the austerity-driven closures of domestic violence services supporting migrant women and women of colour. I remember the first inklings that something was wrong with my body. I remember opening the letter that said I'd been accepted for the PhD and linking my arms with the arms of my husband and dancing, dancing around the living room, crying, crying both, checking again and again to make sure I'd read it right. Now it's been six years, and all of those and the six before it under Tory rule. It's been six years, and five loved ones have died, too many by suicide. Brexit, then Trump, vast acceleration of climate crisis, planetary catastrophe, racist police bill, racist borders bill. Four diagnoses where there used to be none, but a 25% cut in budget and a hollowed out healthcare system not fit for purpose two admissions to the psych ward, one public consultation to reform the Gender Recognition Act, 100,000 responders thanks to trans people up and down the country holding pop-up cyber cafes, even though most of us don't give a fuck about recognition and know that the insipid fight for rights excludes all but those who can benefit from them. Two-thirds said fuck needing a diagnosis, four in five said fuck the real life test, and five in six said fuck the spousal veto, but fuck all changed anyway, and now Britain's Equalities Watchdog is trying to backdoor a bathroom bill, banning us from pissing in public without a recognition certificate, which is impossible to obtain thanks to the failed reform. 50 years since the GLF told us that rights and reform would never be enough, that gay liberation means revolutionary change, that with a coalition movement, we could uproot the entire decaying and constricting ideology. By the way, did you know the first rad femmes were the anarcho fem queens of the GLF who refused assimilation, fought misogyny in the movement and protested the Vietnam War? Half a century after the GLF, two heavyweight feminist academics, Ahmed and Butler, say it again, say it louder. Transphobia is fascism. Policing the borders of sex is about policing the borders of the nation. So-called gender criticality is anathema to feminist liberation. It's been six years and one global pandemic which proved once and for all that if the choice is the economy or the people, our leaders would rather see us die and capitalism survive. That if the choice is vaccinate the world or hoard wealth and intellectual property, you bet your ass I'll choose profit over people every time. A pandemic which saw folks desperate to return to work because the possibility of a swift, painful death from COVID was preferable to a long, slow death by poverty, which saw disabled people as collateral damage. Do you know how weird it is when mates who'd swear they're not eugenicists say with reassuring relief, don't worry, it's only folks with pre-existing conditions who die? Which saw people who once asked, why should my taxpayers' money go on lazy benefit scroungers living the life of luxury, eat their words one letter at a time? when universal credit left them starving. 
we've been telling you for years. Being trans and disabled in 2022 is writing this list and wondering if there's some horror I've forgotten to include. Yes, a lot can happen in six years. Consider this. Someone referred to an NHS gender identity clinic when I started might be receiving their first treatment just about now. I don't know what I was thinking when I decided to research trans sex. Because in the six years that's passed, I've lost faith in those words. I research trans sex. I. Who is this I? Atomized individuals are but a Eurocentric myth, says Hill Malatino. We trans folks lack the privilege of an uncomplicated I. Who is I? Descartes' I? The Cartesian I affirms itself, says Huria Bateja. I think, therefore I am. I think, therefore I am the one who decides. I think, therefore I am the one who dominates. I think, therefore I am the one who subjugates. I think, therefore I am a modern, virile, capitalist, imperialist man. I research transsex. Research. Descartes' I is a violent lie. The mind-body split split us from our interconnectedness and set in motion the Western project of knowledge. Modern rationality, says Anwar Salahuddin, saturates all disciplines in the westernised university. Every tool we're handed, laden with implicit claims to rationality, universality, to binarist duality. Good research is rigorous, unbiased, sterile, dispassionate, says the hangover of epistemic superiority. This philosophy turned our world into an inanimate, inert repository of resources. Amitav Ghosh and Ashish Nandi and countless indigenous scholars know that eco-disaster and ethnocides are but the underside of a corrupt science, born of a worldview that believes in the absolute superiority of the human over the non-human and subhuman, of progress over tradition, of manly values over sensitivity. I research trans sex. Trans? Who is trans? Juno told me everyone is trans. Travis told me everyone is trans. I didn't really get it, until suddenly I did. Trans only holds up if there's any certainty in cis. But guess what? Peek behind cis and you find more of the same. No one is cis. Jules Gill-Peterson tells us that cis isn't an identity, it's a diagnostic. A description of a system organised to subject people to the authority of institutions, the state, medicine, law and the university. Cis weren't even a thing till the invention of gender, 60 years ago, devised in a panic to rescue the rapidly failing sex binary. Whilst we're on it, this newfangled sex science was built on the medicalisation and forced surgeries of intersex children, something still practised today, so anyone with concerns about trans kids' access to medical intervention might want to redirect their resources to the intersex rights organisations fighting for bodily autonomy. Cis is not just a fiction, it's a racialised fiction. Genders are racial categories, because like Travis Alabanza tells it, trans people don't own misgendering. And like Marquise Bay says, blackness makes for gender trouble. Access to the privilege of normative genders, and indeed normative transgenders, confers proximity to whiteness. Gender's legibility falls along racial lines. Before what Huria Buteja calls the great colonial night, there was an extreme diversity of sex and gender relations. Is that what James Baldwin meant when he told Audre Lorde that the black sense of male and female is more sophisticated than the Western idea? Whilst careful not to romanticise or homogenise, we cannot ignore that our present day notion of trans, of feminism, emerged out of capitalist and colonial expansion. So, I researched trans sex, but the conditions that have enabled those words to emerge have, in a very real sense, everything to do with colonialism and white supremacy, everything to do with neoliberal capitalism, everything to do with our current moment in time, which I hope we can all agree is pretty fucked. Who would have thought the sex bit of I research trans sex would be the least contentious? The most salvageable. How can I resist the imperialist imperatives of trans and research? 
How can I resist the academic lesson and detachment? Can I refuse? Can I refuse bodily and emotional detachment? Refuse the methods-driven, impact-obsessed, neoliberal aims of the academy? Refuse the separation of ontology from epistemology from ethics? Can I refuse the way academia wants me to separate the research from the body that produced it and the context it got produced in? If academia demands detachment, but I refuse to be severed, what am I refusing to be severed from? The answer is love. I believe in love, in the Frarian value of love, its power to resist oppression, its absolute necessity to engage in dialogue, love as synonymous with dialogue. I believe that connection creates the conditions necessary for knowledge sharing, and I believe that without love, we're fucked. I believe in love as a verb, not as bell hooks reminds us as in cathexis, but as an action which automatically assumes accountability and responsibility. Love, as Mariam Kaba insists, as a requirement of principled struggle where hope, like love, is a practice, a discipline. I believe in creating the conditions for love's emergence and the emergence of a politics of revolutionary love as called forth by Huria Buteja. Love as in the love-based justice imagined by Kai Cheng Tom, which transforms violence into growth and repair. It is with this love, which is far from the saccharine sentimentality that late capitalism would have us define it, that I go about what I have come to call intimacy as method. Intimacy is what happens when we rupture and repair, when we storm and survive. This articulation of intimacy might be what Susan Stryker calls a trans method, one that disrupts existing objects and formations of knowledge by attaching itself to anything and operating on it, transforming it. Wherever a boundary is drawn, trans crosses it. It reconstitutes the relationship between here and there, this and that, object and other. A rupture and repair, never the same again. Intimacy has everything to do with interdependence and mutual aid, as in Hill Malatino's concept of an infrapolitical ethics of care which enable us as co-constituted interdependent beings to repair, rebuild and cultivate resilience in the midst and aftermath of experiences of overwhelming negative affect. Intimacy as method is when I said, of course, when you asked to show me how your new chest was healing up, even though the ethics board insisted we all keep our clothes on, because bearing witness to this latest transformation was a vital act of love that I refused to reject. It's baking food with great intention before we meet. It's saying me too when you tell me about your CSA. It's letting the tears fall. It's breathing deep into where I feel it in my body, imagining myself with roots deep into the ground and branches strong and wide like I could weather anything, like I can contain the power of this horrific experience you share with me. Intimacy as method is taking that wanking tip home and trying it out and telling you about it when we next meet. Intimacy is what happens when our access needs are just met. It's what me and Mingus describes as the closeness we feel when our disabled bodies feel safe and at ease with each other, the way our bodies relax and open. Access intimacy is a freeing, light, loving feeling it's being told it's okay to pre-record this presentation in case I'm too sick or too autistic to present in real time. It's my colleague come housemate being my PA at this conference, enabling my first travel in years. Intimacy as method centres care. It is careful, as in full of care. Not self-care exactly, but collective care. Like Ruth Pierce's methodology for the marginalised. Like Leah Lakshmi Piepsner Samara Sina's care work, which tells me to stop apologising for needing things to be slower, safer. That I can bring in disability without feeling like I'm writing about boring private things. It's a care that says it's okay to tell the conference attendees I am grieving. Intimacy as Method takes up Hill Malatino's Trans for Trans Praxis of Love, which is many things an ideal, a promise, an identifier, 
a way of flagging an ethic of being. It is anti-utopian, guiding a praxis of solidarity in, in the interregnum. It is about small acts guided by a commitment to trans love. Small acts that make life more livable in and through difficult circumstances. It's about being with and bearing with, about witnessing one another, being mirrors that avoid the cis-normative reflection that frames trans folk as too much, not enough, failed or not yet realised. Intimacy as method insists, as Stryker does, on an epistemic parity between the disparate knowledges of the scientist, the philosopher and the whore. Intimacy as method is a refusal to discredit what our own carnality can teach us. My refusal to deny the skills I learned from a decade of sex work. Intimacy as method is knowing that the people in my research can be better served by the customs of consent and rituals of aftercare that came from kink community than from university ethics procedures. Intimacy as method says, if you think your body is broken, I'm with you. If you think it's a gene, I'm with you. If in one breath you've always known and the next you never knew, I'm with you. Intimacy as method says, I don't really give a fuck about transsexualities per se, but if you knew you were gay before you knew you were a man, I'm with you. If the dream of that sweet het marriage or the glory hole or the dyke sex is what tipped it, I'm with you. I'm with you. Intimacy as method is knowing that everything is connected, that all things emerge relationally, ephemerally. Assemblage thinking comes easy to trans scholars because we know intimately how nature and culture are always assembling on the gridded dance floor of intelligibility. That matter is lively, that flesh matters, that humans aren't the sole arbiters of agency. How our very existence in the academy changes it. It's been six years, and I guess I still believe in the transformative healing potential of queer and trans fucking, which is to say queer and trans art, which is to say queer and trans love. What follows is a collage of trans fucking art love that I guess are what might be termed my findings. Let's devise hot medical role play where we process our gender identity clinic trauma by getting off. It's time for your appointment and you've cast me in the role of doctor and I must test to make sure your spontaneous erections are under control. They're not. And examine you to see if the titty skittles are working. They are. Or how about we use the queer art of asking to be seen and through our shared intention this energy dick will come from nowhere and it will enter this summoned cunt and even though we're both clothed this is PIV no doubt about it. Let's use a fat roll of cling film and wrap it tight around and around like a see-through miniskirt, compressing everything from your waist to your thighs, shaft and gland squished flat against your belly, frenulum facing up, facing your lover, ready for tongue-flicking cunnilingus, grinding, scissoring. Let's read fucking trans women together and use it like a manual. And later you'll tell some researcher that the first time you fucked someone with the same body as you, it changed your life. That sleeping with another trans woman felt like your heart was being lifted up through your body, like it was the first time you'd had sex and actually enjoyed it. Or how about you chop this cucumber in half and you tell me you won't even have to hollow it out because you can start small dick fucking it and it will get wetter and wetter and you'll actually make a hole in it. And the fist pumping action as your tea hard clit sucks in and out of the hole you've made will make it feel like this was always how you were supposed to wank. Or what about strapping on with a dildo? Because ever since you found the words that work, like femme, like dyke, like pussy, you can fuck this way and enjoy it. And if you enjoy it enough, the leather straps of the harness grow like roots into your body, which drink your sexual energy and transform silicon into dick. And you're able to fuck with it, no question, it's a part of your body. Or how about the way your 100% top cis boyfriend never fails to remind you that being a gay bottom and having a vagina is like perfect because he can just wake you up in the night and fuck you and how he shows his trans solidarity by having the grinder profile for you both 
and arranging the group hookups with men he screened by fucking with them to test if they're transphobic. Or how about when a sexological body worker invited you to introduce your genitals to someone who'd been told you're about to meet some genitals that you've never met before. And just this simple exercise of letting go of gendered assumptions allowed you to stay present for the first time in all your 60 years on this earth to genital touch from another, which you tell me through sobs of gratitude and wonder. Or what about reinforcing the kitchen table so that once your phalloplasty is finally healed, you can fuck as hard as you like without breaking the furniture and you'll see the pleasure that's being taken, being given, that your trans cock has sent someone to this space and your mind will be blown. And how about whilst you're recovering from top surgery and you can't lay on your front to get yourself off, you find to your astonishment that you could make yourself come by direct stimulation, something that before you got rid of the tits was unthinkable. I'm not sure exactly what I'd imagined would come from this PhD, but it's coming to an end now. And through this terrifying moment in time, while so many of the words I once used have crumbled and the world seems to be crumbling, some things remain. Let's try and love ourselves back together. Let's rupture and repair and heal and grow strong and transform ourselves and each other and unfuck the world 